Good evening and welcome back to the Thursday, January, excuse me, Thursday, September 6, 2018 meeting. Uh, it, we have just returned from our executive s session and I would ask that everyone please rise while we say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I will just run through the agenda briefly. I see we have, I think, a number of people here for public comment, so I'm gonna, then we'll go into recognitions next, and then we'll go into public comment, our first opportunity. Then we will have a number of reports to the school committee, and then we will go into uh, new business, including a number of different policies, the Boston Athletic Association and the 26.2 Foundation. We will have uh, Mr. Keller, we'll talk about the Middle School Herald Advisor, he will also talk about the Hopkinton Middle School two full-time employee positions. There will be a discussion on the high school hockey team overnight trip. There will be a discussion uh, with Dr. Zaleski on the middle school paraprofessional. We will go through the, the policies and then we will it, come back. We're actually gonna skip item M tonight because Ms. Barreth is not here to do the meeting minutes procedure review. We will decommission center school officially, since obviously we're not using center school right now, and then we will go into old business for a group norms update in the superintendent's goals, and then we will have another opportunity for public comment, and we will go into items by consensus. So at this time, I'm gonna start with uh, recognitions, and I believe is um, Mrs. Dubo coming up for that? So this is what we really miss in the summertime is with the, the recognitions coming and we don't do a lot of this in the summer so this is a real treat for us. She noticed one of her students was choking. This was quite scary, not something that um, you ever plan for. She administered the Heimlich maneuver. That was successful. Nurse Burns followed up, made sure everything was as it should be, and we now have a wonderful second grader here with us today. I'm very happy for my teacher talk, talk, helping me and for Mrs. Burns um, helping me with um, the choking because if they didn't save my life, I, I would die and that would be very sad. So our teachers do much more than the basic academics. Mm -hmm. They truly care for your children as if they're your own. So the fact that this was done without hesitation, without missing a beat, just speaks to the level of commitment that our staff have for your children. So yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and I just want to say Mrs. So Farrell stayed calm, cool, and collected through the whole thing, which I think helps helped him um, stay calm and cool and the same with mom, <laughs> mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so I, I really appreciate the fact that she also stayed very calm in addition to saving, you know, doing the Heimlich and saving him, so. I was shaking after. <laughs> oh, sure. That's you. amazing. Yes. yes, great, great story, happy story. It is a wonderful happy, happy story. So these are some of the great things that you don't hear about and even some of our staff members as we respect confidentiality of students and everything that happens. This was a surprise because they carried on without missing a beat for their day and that is amazing for someone who can go through, it's quite an emotional experience oh, and then yeah. to move on to math, handwriting, <laughs> whatever it might be after that yes. um, is quite remarkable. Yes, yes. So thank you all for taking a moment thank to let you. us recognize I this great staff the member. Nurse. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Well deserved. Well done. Yeah, there's no words for, for that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thank you for coming in. I hope Elmwood has been a great experience for you so far too. Do you like Elmwood? Do you like Elmwood? Do you like Elmwood School now too? Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's good. Well, we're happy you're here. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Those are beautiful, beautiful flowers. So the next recognition is I wanted to, and all of us actually were there uh, for the Hopkinton Youth Commission sponsored a new student and new family ice cream social over at EMC. And they, uh, Dawn Ronan is the one who thought that up with the support of the Youth Commission and reached out to the school department. And it was a really, it was a great success. I think it was a great opportunity to talk with a lot of different families and so appreciative for the Youth Commission and for Dawn for coming up with the idea. and look forward to collaborating with them on more things going forward so thank you to them yeah. and my recognition uh, goes out to the DPW the Hopkinton Police Department and HCAM um, as many people are aware we have changed the pet traffic patterns on Hayden Row Street we worked with an engineering firm and I have to be very honest I was skeptical about whether or not it would work and honestly I think it has alleviated a lot of the traffic jamming that has happened previously on on Hayden Row and we couldn't have done that without the messaging of HCAM and the help of the police department in the DPW so a shout out to them and thank you that's great thank you so that brings us now to our first opportunity for public comment, and I do think there are a number of people here that would like to speak. So I'm going to invite, we have a couple of chairs up here, it, if people want to come up a couple at a time to speak. Uh, it, we try to limit public comment to about three minutes each just because it, of the volume of public comment we get. And if I'm going to, you know, send, um, what I've been trying to do this year is if there's follow-up required to try to keep a list if anyone wants to leave their email and their name that would be helpful I can pass a pen and so if you could just just state your name sure. uh, and then you can Do have to hold the button down here uh, no? nope, you're okay. all set. Hi. Uh, Joe Skelly 13 Stonegate Road uh, I'm here today to talk about some concerns regarding the after-school transportation uh, changes that occurred this year so um, I'm sure you guys are all aware of the change, right? Old process to new process our kids are now on the bus for um, roughly an hour at a time. So to me, this creates unnecessary safety issues, um, as well as we're seeing social and emotional issues with our children over the course of the last week, just because they're seeing their friends get off the bus since the buses do go by our home in our neighborhood, and they're unable to get off with their friends. It's, it's just created um, some, some emotional issues over the course of last week, lots of, lots of crying, where previously Kidsboro was something that they, they really looked forward to, and now um, they don't. So uh, in addition to that, I think, you know, we're paying for a curriculum that we're missing out on, right, given the delays in the bus schedule. So I uh, just wanted to voice my concern here to the school committee and make sure that we try to um, resolve the issue as, as, quick as, we, as quick as we can. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, um, Amy Beck, I'm from uh, 11 Valleywood. I'm Pravina, 36 Huckleberry Road. Um, we're actually here on a different topic. We're here um, representing a group of parents who are very concerned about their advanced learners in the schools. Um, we're considered the Advanced Learner Parent Advisory Council. Um, we've been meeting with a very growing group of parents who are feeling that the needs of their students are not being met. Um, we've shared a lot of our stories with Dr. Kavanaugh and uh, we won't go into them now, but the biggest takeaway from that is that some of our very bright students um, are disengaging, and they're not excited to learn, and, beca and because of that, in, often, in a number of cases, they become a challenge in the classroom, um, behavior or any other number of reasons, other things that take place. But uh, we would like to ask how we can be um, included in the strategic three-year strategic plan that's coming up that includes uh, groups like CPAC and LPAC and HEF and any number of them. We would like to have our place at the table as well. And so we want to ask how can we do that? So I'm just going to just as a matter of policy, just we don't actually, we can't actually answer the questions on, on okay. a broader level, but I have noted what you're 
and that we could maybe take an offline conversation to work around that but just because of open meeting while we can't that's take fine up new topics no nope, that's really, fine we just I, I we want to be heard and that's the big yep. thing so okay. thank you great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks you very much. Coming. And thank you also for coming here to bring it directly to us. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello. I'm Alex Harris, uh, 3 Pond Street. Um, I'm also here echoing some of uh, Joe's message about transportation. Um, I'm uh, just trying to speak up for other parents who are working and having to sort of juggle the transportation situation. Um, not having gotten much of a communication in advance, uh, we're in a state where we have to choose between having our daughter on the bus for an hour or pick her up uh, early and take time off for work. And uh, also, at the same time, we're trying to figure out what's coming up next. We don't know what's coming up next if there's a solution. Um, and in the meantime, we're paying for childcare and we're spending extra time away from work that's being kind of a burden. Um, what we're really looking for is a solution and sort of all sides to work together because it's really about the children and we wanna make sure that uh, we have a solution that works well for them and works well for the parents. That's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And just, and I know there are others that want to speak on that as well. The school department is aware of that and is working uh, to, to get back. But I, I do, I'm not, not, not cutting other people off. I just wanted to share that piece. So. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Lisa Oliver, 5 Gibbon Road. Um, I'm also here for the transportation. I'm not gonna pile on to all of the things that they said. I agree with a lot of what is said tonight, but um, as you can imagine, with social media and a lot of folks talking in town, this is very, obviously a very hot topic right now with a lot of the parents. Um, my main concern is the safety of the children where they're now getting on a bus that has two different stops for them to get off. And anyone older than a kindergartner is able to get off their home bus stop without a parent there. And so, um, my main concern is a child not knowing which bus stop to get off that day or forgetting getting off their home bus to an empty house. Yeah. And what, you know, what do we do at that point? So that's my main concern along with obviously the long, you know, we're missing out on a lot of the curriculum we are paying for after school care. But to me, the biggest concern is just the safety of where they end up. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for you coming. Hi, I'm Kate Skelly, 13 Stonegate Road. Um, my husband already echoed some of the concerns, but I just wanted to add also, um, again, my concern regarding the transportation to Kidsboro, Kidsboro, no longer having a dedicated bus that goes directly from the school to Kidsboro has caused um, a, an abundance of issues. Um, Primarily, I, I think safety is the biggest one, having the children unnecessarily being on the bus for a longer period of time. Um, not only now where it's sweltering hot, uh, my daughter came home the other day and was told because of the bus rules of no food and drink that she wasn't able to have any water for that full one hour period and she was very hot and that concerns me. And then um, obviously heading into the winter months, we're not clear on a timeline in terms of whether the issue is being worked on and how long it's going to take to be resolved. So um, my concern obviously is, you know, heading into the winter with snow and ice and, you know, again, having the children ride these buses for longer than they really need um, is, is just not necessary. Um, it seems as though the Hayden Row location in particular uh, has been the location where they don't have the dedicated buses anymore. And there's also confusion as to why the Marathon Kidsboro location do have these direct buses and why Hayden Row is different. There seems to be a lot of incons inconsistency. Um, so I think we're just hoping today to get a better idea of how this issue is being addressed, when will it be addressed, and when will it be, and how will it be communicated. A lot of us um, didn't even find out about this until the first day of school through bus drivers and friends and things like that. So just some clarification is needed around that. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. Uh, Matt Karras, 260 Pond Street, and I'm also here to talk about busing, so I apologize if what I say is redundant, but I do think it's important the more people come to talk about these issues to make sure you, and I know you guys are aware, but to really emphasize how big of an issue this is to the community. I came to the meetings last year where, you know, when the initial discussion was taking place about eliminating multiple bus stops, and then for the second meeting when the revisions came out, which I think is kind of what came to pass today, I think we're all kind of skeptically optimistic about that revision. We still had some multiple busing allowances, but, you know, the one child being on one bus and allowing for all those, you know, additional stops and the routing issues, I think, are some of those concerns are coming to fruition. So, you know, it, it seems to me that I don't know exactly what the right answer is, but, you know, I'd like to see us go back to something that's almost maybe a little bit more like the old days where there's some dedicated buses to eliminate the routing issues, but still maintaining, you know, some simplicity to the schedule where there's not constant changes going, go, uh, being requested. It also, we also got an email recently about some online dismissal capabilities versus sending in a note from home. Not sure at all how that might help the situation down the road, if that can be something that can kind of dovetail into this issue down, you know, long term. Um, but, you know, I think um, th those are the real things that I wanted to bring out. You know, if, if we're limiting the amount of changes and you're limiting the amount of uh, multiple stops, uh, but, but still providing some flexibility, I think there's a good happy medium that we can find that will hopefully kind of make, make things a little bit smoother. And uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but essentially that's, I, there was one other thing, but now I can't remember what I was going to say, so it couldn't have been that important. But um, anyways, appreciate, we did, I did really appreciate when you, you heard what the community had to say last year when, when there was talk of eliminating the multiple bus stops and it really helps people who do have to work, you know, Hopkins in a little bit of a commuter town. So with two parents working sometimes an hour away each, it's just not feasible to only have one stop. So I really would hope any solution will still kind of provide that flexibility. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Hi, I'm Anna Heaton, um, 91 West Elm Street, and also here to talk about the busing situation. Um, our family is in a little bit of a different um, situation here where we've actually withdrawn both of our children from Kidsboro. Um, after getting that bus schedule, we were actually away, away on vacation. Um, I immediately contacted Leslie, seeing you know the schedule that had come out. I just didn't want to put him through that. So similar to the Skellies, you know, we didn't want him to be driving by our house, watching his friends get off, and we just didn't want to put him through that. He's only six. So I would just encourage you all to also think about um, just the transparency around publishing that bus route list. While, you know, I believe that the concept was there, I think the execution is a little bit poor. Um, and it, it just looks like for a lot of those routes, Kidsboro was just tacked on to the end, which we live on the Upton side of town. You know, the bus list is saying that from where we are, the last stop to Kidsboro, it's a six minute ride and there is no way that any bus driver can make that in six minutes. And if they do, they probably shouldn't be driving a bus. Right. Yeah. So um, that's sort of, we find ourselves in a unique situation. Um, we were not within that 30 day withdrawal period at Kidsboro, so now we also owe Kidsboro for the month of September. So I think you know everyone here has echoed a lot of, of what I planned on talking about, but um, I would like a lot more transparency and, and a little bit more notice just in terms of you know, where Kidsboro would have fallen uh, in that, you know, bus route. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Is there anyone else who would like to speak uh, for public comment? Thank you all for coming out tonight uh, and expressing your opinions to us and look forward to uh, being in touch in the future. Thank you. All right, so at this time, I think we're ready to move into the superintendent's report. Okay. So I don't usually do this, but I have created some visuals to go along with my report tonight, only because I think some of the topics that we are discussing are things that, you know, you might need to be able to actually see to kind of wrap, wrap our heads around. Uh, so the welcome back is not necessarily something we need pictures of, but they are quite fun, I think. And so um, 
Jen and I did get into all of the schools in the first couple of days, and despite the enormous heat, we um, did see kids really buckling down to teaching and learning, and a lot of enthusiasm, as you can see by the Elmwood art teacher right there. <laughs> so we made our way into the art room as well. Uh, just some more uh, pictures of the goings on. We have a, a middle school classroom. Principal Vanessa Bolello watching kids file into their very, very warm cafeteria as the air conditioning is not working in that room. Um, but some exciting pictures, too, of buses pulling up to the new Marathon Elementary School. So that was an exciting morning. All right, so my second topic is enrollment. And here we are, we are one week in, and our current number is 3,721 students. If we go back to some of the NESDEC reports from a while ago, uh, 3,700 was to be reached in the year 2024, I believe. So we are way ahead of where NESDEC had once predicted we would be. Uh, what you see on that slide right there, you can see where the enrollment was in our schools at the end of 2017-18, and those are probably the June 1 SIMS numbers. And then you can see how many students we have added during the summertime and um, where NESDEC thought we would be and what the difference is. So some of the line items that are really important, if you look at the kindergarten numbers, NESDEC thought we would be at about 202 students. And last year when we made our, um, our kindergarten classrooms, we thought that we would probably need about 11 classrooms and that those classrooms would be very small. And we had eliminated pairs based on, on that. Uh, today, we are at 261, so we are 59 students ahead of where we thought we would be. So we have, in fact, added two kindergarten classrooms and we have increased the class size in kindergarten. And so uh, earlier in the summer, we did bring back four paraprofessionals, but that does not put a para in every single one of our classrooms. Uh, you can see grade two is up 17, grade three is up 14, grade four is up six, grade five is up 17, and then we have grade six. This is another one of those grade levels where there are many, many more students than we anticipated. So there are 25 or maybe 26 now. I think that that number has actually even changed since this slide was created. Uh, but that's how many more sixth graders we have than we anticipated having. And so when we you know, did some dismantling of teams last year, we are finding that we have to put teams back in place. Otherwise, our class sizes would be huge. And Mr. Keller will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, grade 8, we are at 17 above. And grade 9 was also kind of a, a big influx with 12 kids joining the ninth grade. And there's almost a particular logic about why students arrive at different grade levels. So kindergarten is obviously very big because people want their kids to have the K-12 experience in Hopkinton. Middle school is another one of those places where students tend to join and then they will stay with us for the next uh, seven years. So there's a good bubble at grade six. And then I kind of combine in my mind or in my thinking the eighth grade and ninth grade because what they're really looking for is that high school experience. So whether you join in grade eight or grade nine, um, people are here for the high school experience in Hopkinton. So if we looked at grade eight and grade nine uh, together, we're at 29 students there. Long story short, if we look at the enrollment at the end of 2017-18, we were at 3,584. So we were above uh, where NESDEC predicted we would be at that time. And um, when we take a look at where we are now at 3,721, so NESDEC would have thought we were, should be at 3,532. We exceeded that last January. So we could have accounted really for about 50 of those students, but now with 189, we're really about 139 kids better. And even if we thought to ourselves, more kids will join us in the summer, there's still sort of a rationale there that says we could never have predicted for those additional 100 students, not with the NESDEC planning. And I don't blame NESDEC for it. It just sort of is what it is. Um, it's, it's a service that they provide to us. But if we think about our per pupil expenditure, and the link to um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is in here, Currently, our per pupil expenditure is at $14,557.98. And, 
If we looked at the 189 students who joined us, that would be a $2 million cost. Uh, if we based it only on 100, because we had a good sense that we would probably have those 89 students, we're still talking a million and a half dollars from where we, we anticipated that we would be. So budgetarily, uh, we are doing, I think, everything that we can in our power, given the dollar amount and the resources and the personnel that we currently have in our schools. Uh, but I think going forward and going into this budget season, we are going to have to think very hard about the influx of students and why Hopkinton is so desirable. But I think we also need to consider um, all of the developments that are happening in our community. Who lives in those developments? Are they school-aged children? Um, what kinds of um, needs and wants and desires do those families have? And, and what kinds of uh, demands would they like to see from our schools? because that's really important. But even more important than that um, are issues like um, busing. So busing is expensive, and the more students we bring to the district, the more buses we need in the district. Special education costs, the more special education students we bring to the district, the more special education um, costs we're, we're going to be seeing. So those are some of those bigger picture items, and maybe the biggest of them all is physical plants. At some point, we just don't have enough classrooms to accommodate the numbers of students who want to move into Hopkinton. And it's a lovely problem to have. We love to have families who want to be a part of our Hopkinton public schools. But at, at some point, we have to think also about growth in the town in terms of buildings. So we are, I think, on the cusp of something um, that we have to take very seriously as we look at the next budget season. I had contacted um, Amber Bach, who is over in Westboro, and one of the things that they did when they saw this sort of, when they saw, saw this sort of explosion of growth was to hire a firm. They put out an RFP not only to look at um, sort of stu students, demographics, numbers, enrollment, but also to talk about the big dollar factor impacts on their community. And that's something that I think you know we may want to think about because it's more than what NESDEC does. Sure. Yeah. sure. All right. So we do have a budget process timeline. Um, this is what I received from the town hall. This is only a draft at this point. And as Nancy had said to me the other day when uh, this was first released, one thing that we probably need to think about is the January 1st deadline for school budget. We might need to just push that out um, a couple of days because uh, that feels somewhat uh, early. And there's that whole transparency piece that if you try to squeeze this in before the winter holidays, it, typically is, is difficult to do. We have the capital process outlined, and that came from um, Town Hall as well. So I think that we're in good shape in terms of getting something together for uh, entering into budget season. And I know that I had mentioned this in my recognitions, but I did want to say thank you to uh, parents and to students as well as the DPW, uh, the police department, the uh, crossing guards, and HCAM. Uh, what's happening at the high school in the morning feels a whole lot safer. Traffic is moving on Hayden Row, and we could not do it uh, without uh, the help of crossing guards, SROs, the police department, HCAM. It's, it's been a wonderful partnership in the community. All right, and then the last thing that I think I have uh, is just a little bit of an update on the diversity survey that we had put out in the summertime. One of the concerns that we had was will we get enough respondents for it sort of, you know, to make some kind of a difference. So the numbers of respondents, we have 97 teachers who responded, 131 students, and we only looked at students in grades 8 to 12. We put the survey out to alumni, and we had 37 respondents, and we had 440 parents uh, answered the survey. So I'll show you a little bit of the quantitative data that we got, but also a little bit of the qualitative data. If you look at some of the demographics of the alumni respondents, three of those students identified as black, one is Latino, two is Pakistani, one is Asian. Two define themselves as either poor or lower middle class, five bisexual, and four gay. So looking at those numbers, and if you think about those numbers out of 37, they certainly do not represent the demography of the kids who inhabited our schools in perhaps 2015, 2016, 2017. So my interpretation of that is that uh, the kids who belong to groups that are traditionally marginalized were kids who spoke out. 
um, quite a bit. And what I have done is just included five of the quotes that, that they gave to us. Um, the first one is, I didn't feel comfortable coming out until the middle of high school, and it was definitely due in part to homophobic comments heard throughout elementary and middle school. Uh, I was made fun of for my hair, my weight, the fact that I had hand-me-down clothes, or how I couldn't afford to have the newest flat-screen TV. Every day for years, I was made fun of for the color of my skin and how I looked. I wish I felt more supported as a student, even when I wasn't on top, of, wasn't the top of my class and playing sports. And obviously, every little detail of every day isn't pitiful. But beware of the belief that the white athletic body girl with money is the best girl in this town. So they are clearly expressing their marginalization. And I think that that's something that's really important to us going forward. Uh, one thing that I believe about a good survey is that it doesn't provide us with answers, but it provides us with more questions. And so if our plan is to start up focus groups and have people in the community really explore some of these topics, um, and I'm happy to sort of cull the data for themes, but then have people start to take a look at these themes and how we can better address them. But clearly we are hearing, hearing some voices, and it would be a small faction of students, but I believe that if anyone had those feelings, it's worth uh, our, the school department's um, exploration of, of the issues. I have also included some of the parent voices. And while there are many, many different aspects of this, that you know, emotions, feelings, ideas, thoughts, um, remarks that parents had expressed to us, one that came out very loudly and clearly to me is that there are some parents who would prefer that the Hopkinton Public Schools not even focus on, on this issue of diversity and social emotional concerns um, very heavily. Uh, they, had, they believed that there were other things that were much more important. Uh, so the first parent at the top says the kids are kids and toughen up snowflakes. So there's that sort of belief that this is just the way life is. Uh, there's a second one, little too much focus on equality and not enough pushing <coughs> harder academics. Values are taught at home, in church, etc. Schools should be focused on academics. So there's a couple that have that sort of same mindset. Uh, while this is a topic of discussion today, I hope that the Hopkinton Public Schools continues to focus, focus on academics, math, English, grammar, science, history as the most important topic to put first for our children. I would not like to see the school go overboard with programs related to this topic. And then the last one from early elementary on, staff of Hopkinton Public Schools strive to meet the needs of a constantly evolving student population. From empathy training to anti-bullying, students know that the cult school culture does not condone racism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, or gender discrimination, or the bullying of children with any class of special needs. So you can see that the last one is just someone who thinks that we're probably already doing a very good job. Right, so there's you know, that sort of mindset, and for different reasons, that things are, um, that maybe we don't really need to pursue this. And, and that's something to consider as well. So, um, And as I said, there are loads more uh, sort of parent voices out there. And I think I just sort of chose these to illustrate that qualitative piece and the themes that emerge. These are the more quantitative ones. Uh, this is the statement that uh, I believe the Hopkinton Public Schools addresses the social emotional needs of all learners. The teachers responded uh, in agreement or strong agreement at a rate of 81.4%. So the teachers, about 80% of them think that we're doing a, a pretty darn good job. Uh, but when we looked at the student responses, uh, they were only in agreement at, uh, or a strong agreement at a rate of 68.7%. So maybe the kids know something that the teachers don't know. Um, and as we looked at some of the more qualitative data on the part of the kids, the kids very often would say that, you know, there's sort of an undercurrent, that it's not that sort of palpable, tangible thing that happens. And so that might be another area for us to explore. Um, but this is just the kind of meaning making that I think we need to do with this data. And there's, there's obviously lots more of that to be done. And then finally, um, this one was interesting to me because the teachers and the students responded almost at the exact same rate. So the statement is, I have witnessed or experienced a lack of sensitivity from administrators, teachers, and or staff. And the teachers responded at 69.8, and the students re responded at 66.7. So what's interesting to me on that one is that if teachers and kids are both saying that they have witnessed or experienced that lack of sensitivity, 
what is the cause of the lack of sensitivity, right? I mean, if they're telling us that, that that's happening, is it because our teachers just haven't had enough training to know that some of the things that, or our administrators or you know, anyone um, is saying it's just because they haven't had enough training in that area? Um, it, it's hard to know. So this one, I think, is something that is really worth pursuing. And as you know, we're doing the work um, with the ADL. So they've been in to do some of the PD with the middle school and high school. And we, uh, the administrative team has also been working with Calise Warnham to take a look at some of those things. So there's certainly more to come on that, that issue. But the last piece is the focus groups are coming soon. So get ready because we'll be looking for you, for your, your input on that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very mm -hmm. And by the way, I really like the visual. Oh, so thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah. It's helpful. So I'm going to suggest that we take uh, some things out of order because we do have some guests speaking um, and move the school committee chair report as well as the liaison report to the end of the meeting. Sure. Sure. I'm look to my left yep. so that I don't skip over that at the end. Okay. You're going to kick me under the table if, right, I, if right I go right on. Right uh, and then, it, then we can invite Mr. Kildiff up. Um, yeah because he would be next for the uh, Boston Athletic Association and 26.2 Foundation. I also want to say I always enjoy when Mr. Kildoff comes to our meetings. Uh, see, he always brings stuff. <laughs> Thank you. OK, and these, these are like hot nice commodities. Good luck. These are good Thank pens. You. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, I'm going to switch pens right now. I am. Th this is the best pen you'll own. I tell you. The re the re I'll lose it. If, if you just take one second and read the little inscription, um, it really speaks to um, this little presentation I'd like to make. Uh, there really is more to the marathon than uh, running 26.2 miles. Um, Principal Keller will agree with that. Um, there's, there's a lot of work that's uh, being done in the schools that uses the marathon as a platform, um, and you're all familiar with what happens in Elmwood. Uh, that just begins to scratch, uh, scratch the surface. But uh, we're in the second round, I guess you could call it a round, huh? um, of an agreement between uh, the Hopkins Schools, the Boston Athletic Association, and the 26.2 Foundation. Um, and would ha be happy at some point, I'm not going to take up your time tonight unless you want to really drill down, but I, I think probably what we should do, Carol, is to prepare a report that you could circulate Sure. relative to the history of, uh, of both this project and the work that we're doing in the schools. Uh, might be an easy way to do that. But in simple form, uh, there is an agreement that exists between those three parties that, uh, in which the BAA has agreed to uh, deliver to the schools $25,000 a year for 10 years. The 26.2 Foundation has agreed to a $10,000 uh, contribution uh, over a 10-year period. I think this is the sec third year, maybe, of this agreement. Uh, second or third? Quite, yeah, third, I think. Uh, to give you a quick example, uh, the first round, 10 years ago, uh, paid for the bleachers uh, on the football field. Uh, before that, when we ran the, when we put in the first track, the foundation raised money, and uh, we were able to contribute the unreimbursable portion of uh, of the cost of the track. Uh, and there are other things. Look, uh, the last two years, we've been able to, uh, with the support of the administrative team, funnel some funds, and we developed uh, the cross-country track that the, that, the, uh, that the middle school uses. Uh, there's a second phase to that, and we'll be back. we're going to be meeting with the superintendent because w the, the ultimate goal is to create a course that is tough, that's a real course, it's a real cross-country course, not all on roads, uh, but in back of the schools. The, if you haven't been to a, a middle school cross-country meet, uh, it, it really is pretty emotional because the, the other teams literally will stop when the, when the middle school cross-country uh, girls and boys teams run their race. It's really, it's really tr it's heartwarming, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, and, and we want to we want to move into a second phase. That's just scratching the surface. Um, there are other programs that we're involved in. We have funded, um, I think it is now six middle school teachers that have gone through a, an immersion around Greek, the Greek classics, uh, which includes includes a very serious um, course of study. They do get to go to Greece for a week at the end of that. Um, 
in, in, in sort of another example of using, and as you may know, uh, experts on curriculum, I'm sure every school uh, child in Massachusetts, either in sixth or seventh grade, has a section of their curriculum focused on Greece. That's the method to the madness. So because of what we're doing in the schools, we're starting to connect that, uh, and it's really terrific. So I have a check for $10,000 uh, for really last, I guess it's, the, no, it's this year, it's the same year, from, uh, from last year's marathon that we'd like to deliver. And I appreciate, I really do appreciate the opportunity to take a few minutes. Too often these get shoved in, a, in an envelope and sent through the mail, uh, and it's a missed opportunity. But I, I, I could go on and on and on. And on. I, I saw those figures that are staggering. Good luck. Um, <laughs> let, us, let us know how we can help communicate that stuff. Those are, those are staggering, staggering figures. Um, and if this helps a little bit uh, so it doesn't get piled on the school budget, we think that's a good thing. And uh, we're going to continue to do that, and we're going to continue to strengthen our relationship uh, with, uh, with not just your administrative team, but but uh, the students as well. So I appreciate the opportunity to take a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. You. I, I would echo watching those middle school cross country runners by, have the opportunity to run right on the school property is a really fantastic thing to watch and it's, it's neat for them. And I so appreciate all that you have done on behalf of the 26.2 and the marathon. Happy thank to you. do it. And, and we enjoy you coming and thank you for okay. that. Thank you. For all right. Thank, thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. So I don't want to skip over B because I'm afraid I'll forget it if we don't. If, mm. But the, the next item is to vote to ratify the MOU with the HTA paraprofessionals that we discussed in executive session. And for consideration is a requ request and recommendation of the superintendent that the school committee vote to ratify the MOU uh, with the HTA paraprofessionals. That really, I stole your line. Sorry That's all that. right. <laughs> So move. I'll second. That's great. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. Yes. Yes. And it is unanimous and so carries. And that brings us up to item C, which is the middle school herald advisor. And we would like to hear from you, Mr. Keller. Good evening. Um, so, um, Earlier in the summer, I spoke to you about a couple clubs that we were looking to move, and one uh, club that I forgot to ask about at that time is the Middle School Herald. So um, we have a, uh, a writing club, actually, that was started. Um, it's actually last year was its second year, and so it had, it had proven itself, and they um, produced some uh, great materials um, that they put out on a monthly basis uh, that is distributed on paper. We tried electronic before, but we feel like there's something about uh, something being on paper uh, that really kind of catches people's eyes and, and attention. So um, so we would like to have that be an official Hopkinton Middle School Club. Uh, we are no longer um, endorsing the club live. We had a teacher that started that several years ago who's no longer um, at the middle school and we've been kind of cobbling it together for the past couple of years with a few people uh, pitching in and ultimately we just felt like last year uh, we weren't able to really fully support it. Um, so uh, that's that's the, the funds we would like to be used to direct to the HMS Herald. So just, just to, it, it has no budget impact for us because it's just moving from one bucket to another in there. We have questions? Um, subscribe to get a copy of the... I, I would happily uh, have copies of the... Subscription fee? Uh, there, are no, there are no, currently no subscription fees, although we should look into that. But, uh, <laughs> at present, it is free. I'm sorry. It's on a monthly basis. Monthly basis? Yeah. All right. yeah. How many students contribute to it? Uh, so last year, it actually it actually was the brainchild of two students, uh, and they uh, started. I think the first issue was basically those two students and the teacher. Uh, I think the staff is now up to about seven students. Um, so very committed, very diehard students that um, that get really excited. They also deliver. Uh, they are uh, writers, and uh, they're the delivery people for, for the good. paper as well. So yeah, that's exciting. Learning the business end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, then I guess I would seek a motion to approve the HMS, HMS Herald Advisor stipend for 2018 to 2019. So moved. Motion by Meg. Second. 
Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. And so moves. And then we have you here. We put you back to back. <laughs> um, do, I, I didn't know if you wanted to introduce that at all. I don't want to steal your line. It has your name there. <laughs> so I will ask you to talk a little bit uh, to your request for two FTE positions at the middle school. Right. So speaking of budget impact, um, so, you know, Dr. Kavanaugh uh, uh, spoke earlier about enrollment. And as you know, um, Mrs. Ben Benick uh, came when I was unable to be here on August 10th uh, to talk to you about enrollment in grade eight. Um, so at that time, we had 311 students um, in grade eight. Uh, Twelve sections of academics were uh, exceeding 25 students in the class. Uh, and our, our, our related arts class size averages were 29 at that time. So. Uh, we were able to think creatively at that time and flexibly and move a, a teacher who was scheduled to teach a literacy class um, into academics and then ultimately asked, asked you, asked you, excuse me, if, uh, if we could hire a teacher. Um, so those two teachers, then one that was uh, new uh, for um, added to the budget and then one that was internal, essentially joined a seventh grade team, which allowed us to have three teams in, in eighth grade. Uh, which brought class sizes down to uh, reasonable levels in both academics and related arts. So um, uh, then on August 30th, um, we looked back at the numbers and, um, and you know, hopefully you have the document uh, or had an opportunity to look, take a look at the document. Um, grade six as of August 30th was at 307 students uh, and we had two new students uh, actually join us on that date. Um, and so, um, so it, Grade six is different than grade eight. Grade, grades seven and eight have five teachers per team. And one thing that I feel like is always important, and I apologize if you already know this, uh, but at the middle school level, we're on teams. And teams are an important part of what we do. And uh, I, I believe it, it ultimately is at the core of what makes middle schools <laughs> unique and special and able to um, uh, meet the needs of that what can be a difficult uh, period for, uh, for all of us, I suppose. And so. Um, so grade seven, eight does not have, excuse me, does have foreign language. So we essentially have five teachers on each team. In grade six, we do not have foreign language. So there's just the, the four core subjects, English, math, science, and social studies. So when we look at 307 students, we're dividing them amongst 12 teachers. because There's essentially 12 places for those students to go. Um, one of our teams in grade six um, is, um, uh, has some specific training in language-based strategies. So students who have language-based needs are placed on that team. So that team tends to have a slightly smaller caseload. And on the document in front of you, you'll see that uh, overall that, that's team one, and they have 97 students uh, on that team. Uh, team two has 104 students, and team three has 106 students. Um, so, so, um, so right now, uh, with a total of 307 students, we are uh, we have on team two, 14 of the 16 sections are over 25 students, or at or above 25 students, and on team three, 16 of the 16 sections are uh, at or above uh, 25 students. Um, and then, as you can see, we have in team three, class size averages of 27, um, and on team two, 26 uh, is a class size average. So it's very tight in the classroom. Um, I don't believe, uh, if, if history is a, is a guide, I don't believe that we're done adding students. And so, um, you know, and just looking at how things are going in that first week and talking to teachers and being in the classrooms, um, I, I don't feel like it's the best learning environment for that number of students. And so, I'm here ultimately requesting, uh, although uh, difficult in terms of thinking about the impact on, on uh, paying for teachers as well as thinking about the logistics of moving kids and teachers, um, I, I do feel as though uh, what I need to do as, as, as principal is to ask for additional staffing in order to address those uh, high class sizes. So my request at this time is to uh, add two teachers to grade six who would essentially join uh, one of the grade six teams. Um, and so we would create basically a mega team. Uh, we would have two teams that would still have four teachers each, and then the third team would have six teachers each. Um, and then uh, and that would bring class sizes down on teams one and two. Class size averages would be at 21. And on that third mega team, um, it would bring class size averages down to 23. And we would have no sections at or above 25 students. Um, so, 
that's my request and there is a typo so if uh, below that grid on page two I talked about teaching assignments on team three and I'll just review that just um, to make sure that I uh, clarify the typo so what I'm suggesting then is that the teaching assignments would be the English teacher on that team would have four English classes the math teacher would have four math classes a social studies teacher would teach four social studies classes we would then um, have a dual licensed math and science teacher who would teach two math classes and two science classes, a dual licensed English and social studies teacher, or there's also a different licensure called humanities, and that person, whatever he or she has, would be two English, science, two English classes and two social studies classes, and the typo, which is, I guess, more of a, um, a missing piece of information as opposed to a typo, is I forgot to put science in there. So there would be a science teacher teaching four science classes. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, did I? Um, yes, that's what I forgot. Yes, the science teacher. <laughs> Thank you. So, I can jump in a little bit. So, I, this is a tough situation for I think no matter what angle you look at it, it's a tough situation Absolutely. to have too many kids in the classroom, and you think about how difficult that puts the year out. The other concern I have, though, is, is that. There isn't, it doesn't seem like there's a perfect solution because my concern is, and I, I guess I'm, what I'm asking is how this could be handled the most delicate possible way, is kids who are already on, obviously in their schedules, that they're on the team they're already on with the teachers they have and the friends they have, I'm going to guess if we approve this tonight, you're not going to have the person in place tomorrow. Correct, um, yeah. it, I, my guess would be probably October at some point. Is that yeah, so I mean, we, we've talked about if uh, if approved, what would be the ideal timeline? So in my head, it's it's a mid October, um, probably is realistic. I mean, usually when hiring, I like to keep a position open for at least two weeks because I feel like that's that's the ideal window. Uh, so grade six goes in nature's classroom October twenty second. Um, so you know, if, if all works out, the thought would be that maybe this would happen uh, either right before or ideally, I think, kind of right after nature's classroom. Because um, that's kind of a, a little bit of a, that's a four day break. It's an opportunity for if hired and those teachers could come along and get to know some of the kids and interact with them. And um, but yeah, that's definitely it. Obviously, this is not yeah. ideal for anybody. Are there any ways to self select? Or I, I don't I don't know that. The, and I'm generally I have no concept of how this would be for some students. Some students might be thrilled and their families might be thrilled that they might not be in you know where they wanted to be most or whatnot and might welcome the change uh, other students might feel really settled they might have been placed with kids they feel safe with or teachers that felt like a really good match for whatever reason yeah. and being told that they have to switch in October might be difficult what would be how would you select who would move and would there be a chance for parents or to opt out of having their child moved so I think I mean um, so the way we do scheduling in grade six um, you know uh, right uh, we do it in pods and so students are assigned to pods of six to eight students and so that that pod you know uh, years ago we used to have you know if you were in a class of 23 you'd start your day in English and all 23 kids would then go to math and all 23 would go to social studies so we stopped doing that I think three years ago um, uh, feeling as though it gives us a little more flexibility and, and the pod system still allows students to travel with uh, some kids that they know but also be exposed to other kids and, and not be with the same uh, 23 or so kids. So uh, the initial thought would be that we would look at pods um, that we could move um, and so I, so I worry a little bit about like self-selecting even though like that would uh, feel not good saying to be it's able a great solution. No, I, I'm no, just I hear trying you. to figure no, out. No, it's definitely something it, yeah. we talked about. I mean, we talked about a variety of things. Again, this is all. Um, I don't want you to think that we were being presumptive in any way, but it was all kind of like, if this is approved, what are our what are our first steps, and where do we go from there? But I, I do think that self-selecting, unfortunately, would kind of open things up. That because um, I think that our pod system is important to us, and so I would want to try sure. and preserve those. Um, but I certainly, uh, if somebody felt very strongly about, I don't want my child to move off this team, I, I would feel strongly about honoring that um, that request. So the one other question I have, I, I think that I can think of, uh, is so the with the two duly certified teachers. So with the kids that have the, or have the 
one duly certified teacher not necessarily going to be just contained to those two duly certified teachers? Will they circulate throughout the rest of that team as well, or is that sort of a, a mini team within a team? No, um, that would not be a mini team within a team. Okay. So, um, so you know, a, a student might have um, teacher one for math, but then go to the dual licensed uh, teacher for science, okay. and that and. As much as possible. So we, you know, we did this. Um, I believe it's the class that's currently sophomores. I believe that's the very large class. Uh, we brought in a team in grade six of two teachers, and they were a mini team in grade six, mini team in grade seven, and then we actually absorbed them into a larger team in grade eight. Um, and uh, ultimately, that was one of those kind of learning lessons in that. Uh, the mini team was kind of nice, but also what we learned was that it was somewhat isolating for those kids, and that's why um, why I'm now um, moving more toward this kind of mega team model for the kids to be able to experience more teachers, to have that true middle school opportunity, and to be exposed to more kids. So I would, I would as much as possible, we would try and uh, have that student, uh, all students have uh, four teachers as opposed to um, having the same teacher for math okay. and the same teacher for science. That that answers that. It, the other thing that did, I did actually have a question that you triggered. So the, it, looking at the current 10th grade, which was four years ago, they were sixth graders. At that time, were there this, a comparable number of teachers? Because that class is, must have been over 300 as well. Yeah, so when they, I believe they were 308 uh, when okay. they came into the middle school. Um, and uh, and so it was, a, so we had um, the three teams of four, and then we brought on a mini team of two okay. at that time. So th this is, it's comparable in number of teachers that you yes. had at the same time. Yes. Do other people, I don't mean to monopolize. No, sorry. I, I actually emailed almost the exact <laughs> questions that Nancy said I emailed them to Carol because I feel like that that's what parents are going to be concerned about. So, I mean, you know, you're in a tough spot. Um, but the other um, two things that I just wanted to confirm is, so these teachers are going to come in at sixth grade. Then are they going to loop with the kids up to seventh grade because you're going to have a, a teacher deficit in seventh grade in the next uh, year? So that would be the thought, yes. Okay. The, the, so uh, right now in grade seven, we have a mega team. We have one team of five teachers, and then we have one, another one of these mega teams of uh, seven teachers. Uh, and so the thinking, of course, this all would be budget dependent for next year. Right. Uh, but the thinking would be that these teachers in grade six would then um, form a third team in grade seven, join the two that are already up there. and and form a third team. Okay. Yeah. So it wouldn't be limited to just a one-year position that you're hiring for? Correct. Yeah. And then the only other question, which is, I mean, it is what it is, but how are you doing for space for all these classrooms? Um, I mean, so there's definitely going to have, have to be some classroom sharing. Um, and, and again, um, not to be presumptive, but we started looking at everything and laying everything out. And so um, that's not going to be ideal um, because teachers have their classroom set up and so we're going to have to ask for some teachers to uh, move and we're going to have to move some different classrooms around and you know when it, the high school does a lot of classroom sharing uh, and they're used to it but at the middle school and elementary levels I know that it's it's like this is my classroom space and so it's going to have to be a, a little bit of a shift in mindset but um, but it's 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 tight there's no question. Okay. Um, because of the increased number of students in the classroom right now, have the teachers been able to modify their practices to accommodate a greater number of students? Um, I mean, so there's definitely been, uh, I mean, A, it's early. I mean, a lot, a lot of what we've done to this point has been kind of introductory and really they, we just, I mean, I would say, you know, Tuesday and even a little bit um, on Wednesday, or I should say Wednesday and a little bit on Tuesday started kind of digging into the curriculum. So there's definitely been, uh, you know, the, my conversations with teachers today uh, at the end of last week is how they are certainly struggling and kind of uh, just being able to do some flexible grouping in the classroom that they traditionally would do just because there's, there's not the space in there. But that has posed a, a big challenge. Did we ask it all? Excellent question. Yeah, all right. Sorry. So, uh, yeah. the other question that I had asked, and I don't know if you want to speak to this at all, um, on top of what you've already said, is how we will pay for this and um, how it fits in our budget. I don't know if you want to talk to that at all. Or. Sure. So, because we had been able to prepay except transportation in the amount of $327,000, uh, we are looking at that at currently as the funding source for these two. Um, FTEs that have been added. Uh, we have done a little bit of work trying to think about how uh, we will be funding uh, 
the pair that Dr. Zaleski is, is seeking, the four pairs that we've already added to the Marathon Elementary School. And I think at this point, we're still stable. I'll let you speak to that, really. I mean, you should be answering the question, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, so we, we look to our salary reserve, which also um, you have hiring changes you know, where we'd have somebody who may have left who was at the top of the scale and the principals are very good at reviewing candidates and trying to bring them in lower on the scale. Um, so you have some hiring gains. So there's, there's lots of different things that'll play out. You have um, within salaries reserve uh, teachers intent to move a lane. Um, and that will come, you know, the deadline is in October, and if they don't actually attain that lane, so we budgeted for that attainment, but they may not actually get there. So, you know, more and more of it will play out as we get further into the fall, um, but we do have salary reserve. We do have that uh, prepayment as well. So we're still, we're still good. Good as we can good be. That's right. It's September so 6th. So I, 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 good. Yeah, we're good for now. All so right. I, 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 this has been difficult, I know, in all the buildings. Mm -hmm. And I, I commend you and all of our principals at being able to think adaptively at trying to find solutions to some of these much, much larger enrollments than we anticipated. And, and I would be in support and seek a motion to, uh, I want to get the wording exactly right, to um, a, a motion to approve the addition of two full-time employee teachers at the Hopkinton Middle School would be the motion I would seek. So moved. Second. Second. And all those in favor? Yes. Aye. And it so carries. Um, and thank you for bringing us forward and being patient with all the questions. Um, oh, I, please, no. Thank you so I, much for considering. And good luck. And good luck. Um, good and luck. may the move ins that come between now and the end of the year not be so heavy on the sixth grade. Yeah, thank <laughs> or you. Or the eighth grade, perhaps. <laughs> I appreciate it. I apologize for having to come after this. Oh, no. I, it's, it's, yeah. If we could have predicted that all these kids would move in over the summer, we'd be in a different position. But this has never happened, as you know. You've been. Yeah, you've been the middle school principal how many years now? Oh, uh, this is nine. It, this has got to be one of the more challenging summers for you. Yeah, no question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I guess I'll. Uh, yeah, good luck. <laughs> it's seriously. So, uh, so, do we want to come back to the hockey and jump to Dr. Zaleski? Oh, sure. Yeah. You wanna, well, as interesting as we are, you may not want to stay all night. <laughs> <laughs> Riveting, but. Good evening. Hello. It should be. It should be on. Good evening. There we are. <laughs> Thank you for having me tonight. I am um, here to request a paraprofessional for the middle school. So, as previously stated, we've had a lot of folks move in, and um, this particular summer we've had uh, four unanticipated student move-ins um, with pretty significant needs, and so. What I did was I met with uh, Dan Mazur, our team chair, as well as Mr. Keller, and we analyzed our current existing staffing, and we also looked at IEP service delivery grids. And one of the things I do, just to let you folks know, is when we have student move-ins, I analyze across the district because things change. Some might move out. Um, some might not need a particular service. But after analyzing all that over the summer, I uh, became very aware as we got to learn a little bit more about the students because we don't always have all their information right away either so we need time to analyze their IEP service delivery grids recognized that we uh, definitely had a gap and a need so with the four students what we did was we looked at um, all of our current paraprofessionals at the middle school knowing that district-wide I couldn't touch any of the supports and we um, scheduled students according to their what we know about them again we don't know them well but what we know about them um, strategically so that they were well supported but it left us a gap with one particular student who we're currently right now covering with a substitute which is less than ideal which is why I asked to be on the agenda tonight because I don't want to waste any more time with service delivery um, so I am asking for a professional for that purpose so we can immediately give this child what he needs and um, the way that we do it just to give you folks a little bit of a background is when we hire paraprofessionals particularly at the secondary level we try to avoid whenever possible I mean unless it's a safety concern um, a lot of one-to-one -one support and we do have some one-to-one -one support at the middle school however 
what we do is when we hire a paraprofessional, we have them work with multiple different children across the grade spans. So that way the students become familiar with the with these supports and don't become overly dependent or reliant on one particular adult. So as we're preparing them for secondary and post-secondary environments and to foster independence, which really is in alignment with the DESE regulation to foster student independence, particularly in the upper grade levels, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're going to make the best use of this paraprofessional not to be attached as a one-to-one -one unless we, as we get to know the student, that, that need will, will exist. Um, so I feel like we'll get a lot out of this hire, and um, it's my hope that you'll approve it because we do need to support the student. Uh, as far as funding, uh, Ms. Rothermick gave a nice summary. I did analyze my budget, and um, we do have some funding left over from the FY18 uh uh, 240 grant in salaries, which is going to assist with this, as well as um, ESY salary. We have some leftover ESY salaries as well. Um, so I can comfortably fund it, and I say comfortably with great reservation. Um, <laughs> right now, if tone. nobody else moves in, I'm good. But um, but but in all seriousness, I think that uh, you know it's not going to affect us in terms of the overall operating budget to put this position in place and we can fund it appropriately um, and then we just need to post and find somebody right away so if you know anybody out there let me know thank you I, I obviously I, it's important to support all of our students needs and I, I can see why sub using a substitute teacher would not be adequate mm -hmm. for a student who needs right. help so I, I don't know if anybody has any questions beyond that otherwise I would seek a motion to approve the addition of an additional special education paraprofessional for the Hopkinton Middle School so moved thank second okay all those in favor yes aye, aye. aye. thank you thank you thank very, you much very much for thank you. taking time out of your nights and I know. Um, that's good you want to go back now to the um High school hockey overnight trip. Sure. So I, I, my fear is we're going to forget things if we go too far down without them. Agreed. I'm I will. Anyway. To check things off over here. I appreciate that. You can kick me when I forget stuff. So uh, I'm actually presenting this for our athletic director, D. King. I think this was the one evening uh, this week that she had off, and I had said to her, "Please don't come. We can handle this." <laughs> yes. So uh, what we are looking for is your approval for an overnight field trip. Uh, the Hopkinton High School hockey team, I believe, has done this uh, field trip in the past. They go to the Fairleigh Dickinson Tourney, and it is on Martha's Vineyard. So you can take a look at uh, the itinerary that has been offered to you. Uh, they will go down on February 16th. They have a game at 5 and then a game at 7. And then they stay overnight in a hotel. And then on the next morning at 11, they have the consolation game uh, and or the championship game uh, at 1 o'clock, depending upon how they fare. And they return back to Hopkinton on the 17th, somewhere around uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock-ish. So. Okay. Any questions? Oh, okay. sounds like a great trip. And that's vacation, too. They don't miss any school, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then without any questions, I would seek a motion to approve the hi high school hockey team overnight trip for February 16th and 17th, 2019. So moved. Second. And all those in favor? Yes. And, uh, yes as well, and that so moves, and we are, that brings us up to uh, some policy, and I just want to note before we go through each individual policy that these policies did go out by listserv to the district and we did not receive any communication on any of them. Okay. Okay. Not to be out of order, but do you want to go back and do B before we go to policy, which is the MOU? Do we not do that? Do we did, we, no, we did do that. We did do it? We did do the MOU. I just didn't check it out. That's okay. Sorry. Yep. I think it's only the school committee chair report that we're going back to. Okay. All right, let's check now. Oh. I panicked for a minute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to freak, freak you out. So you, you are the f up first with school committee BHC, school committee staff communications. Uh. Okay, so BHC. So um, Amanda did an amazing job perusing every single one of MASC's policies and sort of cross-referencing those that we do use and those that we don't use. And um, we do not, she noted, and, and rightly so, that we do not have a school committee staff communications policy. So um, it, the discussion in our subcommittee over the, the last several meetings, um, we believe that establishing some clear channels of communication via this policy 
will kind of help to solidify how we work collectively as a committee. Um, so we have a, um, a draft of the policy that is cut and pasted essentially, not even essentially, it is cut and pasted <laughs> from the MASC website um, and, you know, for your review. And I really basically it just states that when we communicate to any member of the staff, we need to do so through the superintendent and that it's not appropriate for us to contact a staff member directly. If they choose to contact us directly, that's a different story, but, um, but we, we, should, we need to go through the superintendent. Which is, a, a, from what I gather, a standard throughout the state. Yeah. I think it's also reflected in our norms, which we're gonna cover yes. right. later right. in the yes. meeting, so. Okay, and, and was, the, uh, any comment received from your end I, on this policy? No, none. I don't know if anybody has anything to, to add. Um, it's pretty cut and dry. It, it seems pretty cut and dry. I guess I would be comfortable if nobody has any questions or concerns or things they want to redline and think about that we could go ahead and approve it. Yeah, absolutely. Are you good? Yeah. Amanda yeah. and I have read it like uh, yeah, 15 it, times yeah. at least, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really appreciate how thorough your work has been on policy, both of you, so thank you Great. for that. All right, then. Uh, I guess I would seek a motion to approve uh, the new policy, BHC, as included in our uh, agenda materials. So moved. Second. Second. Fantastic. All those in favor? Okay. Yes, yes, and it's uh, passes, passes for nothing. So that moves us into the next one, which is uh, policy AC, non-discrimination policy, um, with you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. So you see uh, that you have policy AC in front of you. In July of 2018, the Mass Association of School Committees recommended that you simply add language to all of those um, protected classes, and so currently, uh, the one that they tell us is missing is pregnancy or pregnancy-related condition. And so when we took a look at this, we noted that there were a couple of places where uh, you kind of go through that whole list, and so we have made them, uh, I guess, somewhat symmetrical in, in this policy as well as another further on, on down the line. So uh, race, color, sex, age, ancestry, athletic performance, physical handicap, academic performance, gender identity, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, pregnancy or pregnancy-related condition is the additional one, disability or proficiency in the English language. So essentially that is uh, the only change. Um, the one thing that I looked at with this policy is uh, on, on the second side of that sheet where there is a procedural reference, AC-E1, I'm not sure that we have that procedural reference actually in our policy. So I think that uh, we will need to take, take that, that out. out of there. That is we should probably take a look at that. Uh -huh. We do have ACE, ACER, but I don't think that we have an AC-E1. I don't see it. Not on our website. Right. Yeah, no. So we probably no, just, just need to make sure that we remove that cross-reference okay. as well. Good catch. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> it's <laughs> good. <laughs> Sometimes these things come together. Yeah. It's good. All right. So this this one, as I'm understanding it, is really just cleaning up language. 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 Yeah, right. And I so without any comment from anybody, and, and unless anybody here has any comments, I think it's okay to go ahead and approve this. Are you good? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Then I would seek to, a motion to approve uh, policy AC as outlined in our agenda materials. So moved. Second. In favor? Yes. Aye. I'm a yes, and it so carries. So that brings us, I've got to scroll back to my agenda here, to the next policy is, um, again, Dr. Kavanaugh with DK slash DGA payment procedures and authorized signatures. Okay. Really an acronym. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's to see how much we can twist my tongue when I'm Oof. trying to say that loud. <laughs> So currently, our DK slash DGA combines two different policies. 
And the other issue that we have with this policy is it does not reflect our current practice in terms of um, signing the warrant and, and how our bills get paid. And so as a subcommittee, when we got together, we did look to see what MASC had, and MASC divides those two policies into DK, payment procedures, and DGA authorized signatures. And so what I have done is just made a copy of those so that we can all take a look at them. And this is, I think, um, MASC's language verbatim. As a policy subcommittee, we were recommending that this committee look to adopt, to split that those two policies into DK and DGA, and then adopt MASC's language. So in practice, if I could just ask a, a quick question, in practice what this would change is we will go to, we'll do the bills here collectively to look at, the, is that? I, I think what it does is it, um, it changes, our existing policy requires three signatures of the school committee. Right. And this um, eliminates three signatures. Um, unless we're a regional school district, we are not required to have three. We can have one, which is what we are doing in practice, right. but our, yes. our policy doesn't reflect that. So it's, it's basically cleaning that up. And I don't think our procedure that you're doing right now would change. And the okay. entire school committee is still required to vote at the meeting on the payments, on the warrants. Gotcha. And so that will still remain part of the items by consensus, is yes. that? Yes. 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 Okay. What we're hoping is that this will reflect better the practice we currently have in place. Yes. That, that absolutely makes sense to me. Uh, I don't think there would be any objection to it, but I do feel a little differently about voting on this one specifically, and I don't want to overstep the policy just because the, what went out in listserv is different from what we're approving. I don't have a huge stake on whether or not we change. Am I right? Just the new did the new one go out by listserv or did the old one go out the by listserv? The old, list one, old one. Yep. Yeah. So if you wanted to bring it back for a second, I, second bring reading, it back and for just a second. Have these in the packet. Is that what? You and mean? just have yeah. these in the packet yeah. like that. I think okay. that would be. Yeah. I don't see any reason why it would be held up, but I feel like it provides transparency for the public if they want to know it's before we do it. Mm -hmm. Push it to the twentieth. Or yeah. we'll push it out on the twentieth. I think we only might have two that day, right? <laughs> I thought I, I saw a posting. You guys are. We are getting all business are all, right now. All Nancy. business. It no, seems we like we're going to have just a we're wave of policy. I mean, watch out. It's insane. <laughs> I should move over a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you probably might want to. <laughs> uh, okay, so we will, we will not make a motion on that tonight. We will move on to uh, another one with you, Dr. Kavanaugh, School Committee Policy, JFABE, Education Opportunities for Military Children. Okay, and these are two that we currently do not have, uh, but... Uh, these have come to us because of ESSA, the Every Student Succeed Act, and MASC has uh, suggested that we adopt these for children who are in foster care and for children, opportunities for children um, of people in the military. So the first one is JFABF, nope, I fibbed, JFABE, sorry. Up and stapled incorrectly, and that is the educational opportunities for military children. And what you see here is the MASC language. And also, what went out on listserv. It's an interesting word choice, isn't it? Military children. Yep. I don't think I'd like to meet them. <laughs> well, uh, children in the military is okay, mm. but military children it does refer in the policy children say children of military families. I don't know, see any reason why we couldn't change that in the yeah, title. It just seems a little, yeah, I we can change the word. This is the one we pulled right off. So, see. you like children of military families? I think so. Okay, that's don't fair. Any military children? Not here. No. 
So again, we did not receive any comments on this, and it also went out by listserv. Do you have a recommendation on um, from the policy subcommittee on if we want to go ahead with this or if we want to bring it back for a second reading? Looking for just for the two of you, do you have a? I mean, a hope for my, which my feeling was that the, this policy, like the one for yeah. foster children, is looking to um, just provide more support for children who are in a more transitional, can be geographically in a transitional place, so moving from town to town for whatever reason, and it seems. Um, just to give a little bit more formality to what we are required to do to support that. I didn't personally see a downside. I think um, Dr. Kavanaugh felt comfortable with the content. I did. As, so I, I think, in my opinion, I think it's only a plus to approve yes, it. right. Mm -hmm. it, well, um, and but it, if you'd rather have more time for the community, we can wait. It's. I don't feel like this is one that's going to generate. It did go out, and it is an existing MASC yeah. policy. I don't feel like it is one in that is right. going to generate the same level of um, no. community input as some, and, and it did go out as this. I also feel like we have a lot of policy to get through. Yep. If we can approve it here, I would rather do that than rather than bring it back. I would think if this you're one, comfortable with that. that yeah, I, I, I am. I am comfortable. I, yeah. I, I, in fact, I would rather. I mean, because we don't have it in existence right now, the, as long as there's no objections to anything in the wording, I think we should get it in our policy as quickly as possible. Okay. And well, I'll say the same thing for the next one, even though I'm yeah. jumping ahead. <laughs> Likewise. All right, well, then I would seek a motion to approve policy JFABE, educational opportunities for children of military families. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Yes. OK, so that's so moved. And we move into uh, the next one. Okay, and this one is JFABF. Uh, this one does sort of the same thing as Amanda just explained. Um, it you know provides opportunity for this time children in foster care. And again, it's in compliance with the Every Student Succeed Act. Is there any any more that anyone wants to add or question or anything? And I believe I heard a recommendation that um, we go ahead right. and approve this one <coughs> as well. Exactly. I think we need this one on the books. So I think I would agree with that. So I would seek a motion to approve policy JFABF, uh, Educational Opportunities for ch Children in Foster Care. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. And I, and so that one also uh, passes. All right. Then that brings us up to uh, JFBB. JFBB. So this is the policy on school choice. So the policy on school choice, again, is just a, um, a language change. And if you look down to number six, we have discovered that uh, we need to add in the pregnancy or pregnancy-related uh, condition, again, in that area. Uh, this one, you will note where it says race, color, religion, national origin, sex, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, appears twice. It's also, um, again, close to the end. So we would need to remove that second gender identity and keep ancestry, athletic performance, physical handicap, disability, pregnancy, or pregnancy-related condition, academic performance, religious, sexual orientation, or proficiency in the English language. And I believe that all of those um, categories will be reflective also of the one that we just mm -hmm. right. approved. So they are similar now. I mean, before, yeah. I think we had some things in one and other things in another, but not all of them in, in both policies. So this cleans that up a little bit. And again, seems like no substantial changes that would prevent us from passing this unless anybody has any concerns. This version I'm looking at says sexual orientation twice. Did that get taken out? Oh, so, oh, yes, so, yes, so That's both. That's good, so both, yes. Sorry, good catch. So we have to remove gender identity and sexual orientation on their second mentioning. Okay. So with the language cleanup, I think we are ready to go ahead and seek a motion to approve policy JFBB, school choice. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Yes, and it's unanimous, and so moves. 
All right, that brings us to, we are gonna hold off on the school committee meeting minutes procedure uh, when Mina is with us. We'll put that on the agenda for the 20th. Okay. That would be the, my recommendation on that. Okay. All right, I just wanna make sure we're not skipping anything in here. I don't want to say this too loud, but I do feel like we're moving along nicely, so I don't want to just want to make sure we're not missing anything. Yep, she did. I think we should always <laughs> sit in a 90 degree room. <laughs> it's quieted our spirits indeed. <laughs> yes, quieted our spirits. Okay, so the. <laughs> Just get through it. <laughs> that brings us up to item N. And before um, I seek a motion on this, I would like to just highlight, I, I know that you guys are all aware of this, but for people who are not aware of this, on September 15th, we have at noon a ceremony where the school committee is going to ceremoniously turn over the control of the center school to the town, which we know actually in practical terms already has, but we have a very nice large key that we are going to give the Board of Selectmen. Uh, and we have some former principals who are going to be on hand for that. So I would encourage uh, people who would like to attend that. It is open to the public for tours between 11 and 2. And then there, the ceremony will be at noon. And uh, former principal uh, Mr. Arger will be there also reading uh, bedtime stories, uh, although they won't be bedtime at noon, we hope. Uh, and Cubby will be there. And opportunities for photos with Cubby will be there. In an ama the amazing video presentation that, um, thanks to <laughs> HCAM, uh, and then uh, and also th there are quite a few photos that have been brought through many decades. It runs, I think, an hour and a half. Is that? Roughly yeah. It, it, so lots to see um, and lots to enjoy and lots to celebrate about many decades of use for the center school. Um, it also is interesting, having been through the marathon school, going back to the center school, which I did, uh, I think, two days ago to. Um, see what we left behind um, and remember why we moved, but also remember <laughs> the building served us very well for 90 years. And along that line, I don't want to interrupt you, but also the Center School Reuse um, uh, Committee will be there too. Yeah, and they have a table. Information about what um, the recommendations that are sort of in the pipeline um, to be made to the Board of Selectmen. So that's, that's not happening until, I can't remember when. I gotta, the, there's the, there is a table. I. The, the, dedicated for that specifically in the gymnasium Good. in that window somewhere. All right, so. perfect. Are, are you sure we shouldn't keep that key? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 in actuality, really, I don't want to spoil the cliffhanger. all these students coming it's, in, the key is I'll this take big, it is to my house. Big, and it will, <laughs> um, it will be on display very likely a prominent place, either uh, at the school or at the Historical Society. Okay. So, um, little secret, it doesn't actually fit the door. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, See, so probably could. So at this time, I would like a to seek a motion to officially decommission Center School, uh, as it is now a town-controlled uh, property. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yep. And, and carries. And the Center School is officially and technically and really actually under town control. So that. Um, has served us well, and we wish the town well in, in all of the efforts. I know that you're part of that group uh, to figure out the next next phase for the center school. So that brings us, I'm gonna go back so that I don't forget and tr start to close the meeting uh, before we've gone back to the school committee chair report. And I am gonna start um, by saying I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants number 19-011, 19-012, 19-013, 19 19-015, 19-016, and 19-017. All the warrants have been included in your packets. Uh, and then I have also approved for payment the payroll warrants S19004 and S19005. They also have been included in your packet. And I just also wanted to give a little update on the school committee office hours. And for those of you who also were there, please feel free to jump in with uh, things you want to add. But it, it was, no, it was at the 20, 
it was uh, 25th, I think, was the actual date at the farmers market. We held our first school community yes. office hours, and we, I wasn't sure what to expect actually. And it really, it was a huge success. We had a lot of people who stopped by because they saw us and they saw our sign and they had questions about what it is that we do. Uh, and they had some specific questions that some of which are not school committee um, able to answer. There were you know, question, a question about middle school math program, which we d were able to direct to the right school personnel. Uh, and, uh, you know, people, a lot of new families that were just curious about what we were doing. So I was very uh, happy to have that opportunity to engage with families and other people in the district. Um, so that was a, a great thing. I don't know if you guys want to add. No, it, it was great, but I should say that someone really wanted a later start time for the high school. That does so come the students could sleep a bit more. Every high school kid ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So that that was that. And so the other thing I would like to talk about, um, re related to that, is our next opportunity to do a school committee office hours in September. We had talked back when we were at HCAM earlier in May or June about doing rotating afternoon, daytime and evening times. But I, the other possibility I thought just kind of like piggybacking off of what we did at the farmers market would be to potentially spend a little bit of time at the family day on September 15th because then we have people that just happen upon us great idea. idea let's so do it definitely. let's do it on the 15th yeah. um, and perhaps we could be seated near CPAC because we have shared interests and then um, yeah. I will circulate out a, a schedule we can because I'm sure people want to be there with their families as well so we can right. take shifts yeah, that's, great. that's great Thank you, Nancy. all right so with that we will move on to uh, I think we're moving into old business then is that yes we are yes okay yep. so that's back oh so the, the oh I'm sorry I thank you there's supposed to be a big kick that went my way does anyone have any liaison reports that they would like to share I have two but there's some short okay so elementary school building committee um, met uh, I didn't type the date in here but it, I think it was two weeks ago yeah. um, and um, just as a quick rundown the flooring issues are being addressed in an ongoing fashion but all of the classrooms are up and running and everything looks fantastic and so um, the small rooms will be addressed when school is not in session so it won't disrupt anything um, they're being great about how to work around the kids so it's that's all fine um, and as the building is being lived in all of the requests for um, miscellaneous things like um, filing cabinets and bulletin boards and things like that um, are being vetted through Mrs. Dubow and <laughs> she's she's um, she's encouraging this the faculty to sort of live there for a little while before they they re say they really need something but but um, she's also, you know, coming to the building committee if she feels like there's really something that, that needs to be either added or changed in the classrooms. And then the last thing, which I found fascinating, was that all of the chairs that were delivered were all delivered in the same size. However, evidently, the first grade chairs were supposed to be a little taller than the pre-K and the K chairs. <laughs> and and um, W.B. Mason has taken a little bit longer than was originally um, communicated to send us the tall chairs so there's you know as we're sort of closing out invoices and things like that we are um, working with them to try to get the appropriate height chairs everybody's got a chair it's fine but some of the chairs are, are missing so anyway who would have thought chair height would come up in a you know, so anyway and then um, center school reuse I already mentioned um, we will be um, presenting to the Board of Selectmen on the 25th recommendations for reuse um, and they have generally sort of the ones that have floated to the top are the folks that went to the presentation um, at HCAM back in when was that May uh, May June, June yeah June oh, somewhere so that yeah whole period blends together uh, at this point <laughs> so um so the community input has been great and really those those f five or six um, real needs have kind of floated to the top on a repeated basis so um, and there'll be information at the um, the goodbye to center school looking forward to seeing the information yeah that. and that's all I have that's great. Um, I just have an update on the website subcommittee uh, back in the summer the school committee authorized a subcommittee to look at uh, replacing the district website and we are having our first meeting tomorrow 10 o'clock um, we have a committee uh, we have a mission 
and we will be um, finalizing our organization tomorrow, talking about our requirements gathering process, which we anticipate will take most of the fall to really nail down what our new site needs to do. And we will be, um, people can look forward to outreach from us for in involvement and feedback and input. So there will be focus groups, there will be discussion groups, all of which will be talked about tomorrow at our meeting. And I can update you more next time. That's great. It's happening now. That's good. Yeah. That's great. So the, the one, it's not exactly the liaison report, but the one thing I did want to circle back to was the newsletter that we had talked about a little bit. I've alluded to because this is something I very much would like to get off the ground. I had asked Amanda for some techno technological assistance because I um, that's not my forte. And my hope is that we can bring forward some more stuff uh, at the next meeting. It just th This meeting with the number of things on it, I was afraid it was going to end up being quite long. So I did not want to bring it here tonight. So with that, um, I think we, unless anybody else has anything to add. just want to add that um, the first CPAC meeting is coming up um, on the 17th. And also on the 10th, there's a parent support group at the public library at 6 p.m. And am I, did I see the CPAC meeting is going to be at Marathon? Yes, CPAC. in an air-conditioned I, I, I was thinking of that as was In the cafeteria at Marathon. I'm surprised we haven't rescheduled our meetings <laughs> into an air-conditioned environment. But maybe you think we talk too much. So it like does move eat. us along. <laughs> so uh, on, on that note, uh, I would like to turn us to the, the agreed upon norms and operating protocols. And I, my sincere hope tonight is because we have spent a great deal of time on this, that yeah. we are able to yes. take the fruits of the labor we've already done and move um, relatively with, um, expeditiously. Yes, expeditiously yeah. through this. Um, so moved. <laughs> <laughs> So just so that it, it, it we, we can take a look. I know that this has been circulated to us ahead of time. I don't know if people had um, any comments that they did not have the opportunity to share with Dr. Kavanaugh or Dr. Kavanaugh, if you had anything you wanted to. No, what uh, you see in your packet is just what we had talked about last time. And we have taken what we did in July. And the August updates are all in red. That was great. All right, then. At this time, I would seek a motion. I'm going to talk a little faster just to make sure uh, we get it. <laughs> I, I would like a motion to uh, accept the group norms as they are uh, have been updated. To so moved. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. And it so carries. And that brings us into uh, old business item B, the superintendent's goals. Uh, so we probably don't need that, but I will pull this up. All right, so you do have my updated copy um, in uh, your packets, and that is also under old business. And so you can see that there are five goals there. And I should probably apologize because I should have maybe better grounded this last time we were together. Um, so while the superintendent writes goals for evaluation, there's also an educator evaluation rubric specifically designed for superintendents in Massachusetts. So that's what I have put up there on that um, screen so that you can just sort of see it. And it is uh, broken into um, standards, indicators, and elements. So the four standards are instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. Uh, when you see these bolded ones, ooh, I don't know why it's doing that, uh, that say things like instruction indicator, curriculum indicator, those are um, the indicators and below those are the elements. So all of those are also part of how a superintendent is evaluated in Massachusetts. So the goals that I have before you, there are five of them. The first is about establishing our new strategic plan. The second one is uh, professional practice as well as district improvement. And that one is really about building the repertoires of our administrators, faculty, staff, in terms of just cultural sensitivity and diversity. Uh, it's designed really to help our kids to have greater psychological and social safety in our schools. And I think in some ways it's very nicely in sync with all the social emotional learning goals that we see in the school improvement plans district wide. 
The third is a professional practice goal, and that goes along with the NISIP program, New Superintendent Induction Program, in which I am enrolled, and I think that my mentor will be coming to some of our school committee meetings to oh, observe. Fabulous. So, yes, we'll get to meet him. Uh, the fourth goal is to enhance reading and writing instruction at the high school for special educators and special education students. In 2019, for the very first time, the high school kids will not be taking the legacy MCAS, but they will be taking the new MCAS test as grades you know, three to eight have historically been doing for some time now. And in that test, there's a narrative um, task, a a literary analysis a task and um, a research simulation task and our concern is that we really want the students who struggle with writing at the high school level to be well prepared for this so even though it says that it will be for special educators paraprofessionals will be there and the grade 9 and grade 10 um, English faculty will also be there and so we have uh, several days planned during the school year for this professional development and there will be sort of intermittent work looking at student work protocols um, creating portfolios and so that's number four and then uh, the fifth one is about the budget and the budget for me is a huge ordeal uh, based on those numbers that we saw tonight and things like busing and special education and physical plants and all of that I think we we really need to think hard about that as we enter into this season. So I do have um, some stress on the planning board and maybe we will even need to think about throwing out an RFP to um, have a professional firm work with us to, to help us think about what enrollment and, and some of our, our learning needs will be in the next several years. I think that would be shrewd as our numbers yes. continue to explode. Yes. Explode yeah. is the right word. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do know that there are over 400 additional, you know, housing units to be constructed, and those are the ones that have been approved. So we have to think hard. I know. I, I drove through Legacy North yesterday, and I was counting the houses that had been built and populating them with three kids each. And I thought, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we really have to prepare for this. Yeah. The growth is an exciting thing to look at in many aspects, but the budget we have to be prepared for. We have to be prepared for them when they get here. That's right. That's right. All right. So if there are no other comments uh, or questions no, I think on the they're goals. very well written. Yeah. Um, they're great. Thank you, you. You are looking for a motion from us? Yes, to, to approve, approve these goals yeah, for the 1819 school year. Yes. So I'm looking for that motion, as she said. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh, yes. Right. And so that uh, is proof. Thank you very much for all of your um, oh, no, thank you. thoughtfulness on those. So that brings us now into our second opportunity for public comment. Um, we are looking like our, our popularity has waned for the second opportunity. So that will move us into items by consensus. All right. And uh, as the superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote um, to approve the following items by consensus. So moved. Second. All, right. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, and it's unanimous and so carries. And at this point, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> yes. And we are adjourned. Our next meeting is September 20th, uh, to it says 2018 is actually what it should say, oh. at 7 p.m. It's a regular meeting, but it will take place at HCAM Studios because of other things going on um, with different parent nights here. No less than, no, less than, no more than 72. We're going to keep showing up there. So thank you all and thank have a good you. night. Thank you.